Hey guys, sorry about uh, running a little bit late. We had some technical difficulties. Facebook wasn't recognizing the scheduled event, so I had to go in there and create another event and, and get that rolling. But we'll jump right into uh, this first topic we'll talk about, um, and that's just choosing an outfitter, right? Um, so those of you that don't know me, my name is Mitch. I am an outfitter here in Colorado. Um, I did guide across Colorado, Wyoming, uh, Florida, um, a couple other eastern states. Um, and then we just decided to open our own outfit here in southern Colorado. And everything. So I just I went through the process. I understand how um, difficult it can be to under, you know go through it and, and get your license. And, and just all around just picking an outfitter for a western hunt. <clears throat> um, so with the, the draw of Colorado like right around the corner, and, and I apologize, we'll, we'll be a little more Colorado specific on a lot of things, um, but a lot of the, the items that you can look at when you're choosing an outfitter can be across all the states because um, they're all going to have regulations and laws that govern uh, being an outfitter or guide. Um, and like I was saying, Colorado, we just you know released our, our uh, 2022 big game brochure. Um, our draw is right around the corner to start applying for it. Um, so a lot of people are starting to think, should I get an outfitter? Should I not get an outfitter? Um, should I use a guide? Should I not use a guide? Should I try to do it on my own? Um, and we'll get into later videos talking about solo hunting and do-it-yourselves and everything. Um, but specifically, um, we go Fish hunt Owen views request to join live video. Heck yeah. Come on in, Owen. I love people. If you want to join in and ask questions, by all means, I'd love to have you join in and ask questions. Um But the first thing you should think about, especially if you're if you're looking for a big game hunt out in western states, um, and you want to use an outfitter, it's not something that you should probably choose like that season, right? Um, it's something that you should probably think about a few years in advance um, and get to know what what unit you want to hunt in, the outfitters in that unit, contact those outfitters, talk to them, um, make sure that the relationship fits because working with an outfitter guide is almost like a marriage, right? There's, there's laws and regulations that govern it. Um, there's going to be a lot of emotions uh, throughout the hunt um, and there's a huge amount of money exchange right so just like a marriage um, so first off um, what should we talk about is probably like the laws and regulations that govern us as outfitters right and understand that every state's going to be different um, some western states require both outfitters and guys to take an exam and to be licensed. Some states require just outfitters to be licensed. Um, so Colorado specific, we're governed by three main regulations. Um, and those regulations are the four CCR 733-1, which is outfitters registration rules and regulations. Um, this is a Colorado code regulation. This is specific to um, outfitters on how we go about getting licensed and then all the requirements to be licensed um, and some of the stipulations as we carry our license, whether we renew it, whether it's suspended, whether we're fined, um, just kind of code of ethics a little bit in there too. Um, the next big regulation that, that covers us is uh, Title 12. Articles 1 and 20, which is just all the general provisions for any profession and occupation that has to be licensed in the state of Colorado. All right, and that's big, thick, 20-something uh, page uh, title right here. And then specifically for us in Title 12 is Article 145, which is Outfitters and Guides. All right, and this breaks down for the Outfitters and Guides on the requirements for us and the laws that we have to abide by. Um, within the state of Colorado. Now remember, like I said, we're talking Colorado specific. Every state's gonna be different, so whatever state that you decide to um, go get your hunt on in, make sure that you're familiar with those regulations. 
And this is a conversation that you should have with your outfitter, your guide, right? Um, so specifically, in a lot of these regulations, you know, they, they all say the same thing across the board. Um, but we're going to stay with Article 145 right now, Outfitters and Guides. Um, and some of the definitions in here um, that are very important, and that is what is an outfitter, right? What does Colorado say an outfitter is? And this is specifically from 145 right here. An outfitter is a person soliciting to provide or providing for compensation outfitting services for the purpose of hunting or fishing on land that the person does not own. Right, so that's very specific right there, person that does not own. So what are outfitting services, right? So it means providing transportation of individuals, equipment, supplies, or wildlife by means of vehicle, vessel, or pack animal. Facilities, including but not limited to tents, cabins, camp gear, food, or similar supplies, equipment, or accommodations. And guiding, leading, packing, protecting, supervising, instructing, or training persons or groups of persons in the take or attempted take of wildlife. All right, so that covers everything what an outfitter service is. So if you do any of those things, any of those outfitter services in the state of Colorado, you must be a licensed outfitter if it is not on your own land, right? Now, there are some stipulations to change that, right? So that article or that section, right, does not apply to a person who only authorizes a person to hunt, fish, or take wildlife on property that person owns rents or leases so for example if i own land and i authorize somebody to come on that land whether i own it lease it or rent it i just authorize them to come on there to do hunting and i'm not leading them and i'm not providing any of those things with that outfitting service i don't have to be an outfit i have to be licensed in the state of colorado <clears throat> now if i own that land or I'm sorry, if I lease that land, rent that land, or I'm on public land, and I'm providing any of those services, I must be licensed as an outfitter in Colorado. And this leads into what we call rogue guiding, or pirate guiding, or pirate outfitting, right? There's a lot of individuals that will go out there to public land, and sometimes even private land. They will claim that they are an outfitter, or they are a guide. They will take an individual's money, and they will guide them, on that land without being licensed or registered within their respective states all right so that is an issue so as you're looking at getting an outfitter or getting a guide um, for your western hunt probably the first thing you should do is one understand the regulations within your state two you can go to any secretary of state website um, and you can check the license and see if that individual is a registered outfitter within that state um, so you can go on to Colorado Secretary of State website. You can search by license. You can search by my license name or my license number or my outfit name, Rugged Mountain Outfitters LLC. And it'll pop up and it'll show you all the documentation that I went through for the past two months and everything to retrieve my license. And it'll tell you if my license is active. It'll tell you if there's any um, disciplinary actions against me or anything like that. So that's probably one of the first things you should probably do is check to make sure that the outfitter that you're utilizing, if they are utilizing any land, public land, um, or land that they're not, they do not own, all right, um, and make sure that they are licensed within the state of Colorado or the respective state, all right. Um, some of the other things that are required by the state of Colorado and and I would say all states when it comes to outfitting is that you must have some type of liability insurance, right? And some type, and in the state of Colorado, we require a $10,000 surety bond also, right? So those are things that you should probably ask about too, right? And we are required to give them in a contract. We are required to tell you that, you know, I do have liability insurance of the required amount, and I do have a surety bond of the required amount. Um, so ask those questions of your outfitter and make sure that they have the required documentation that they're supposed to have. Um, when you receive or when you, you go into contract with that outfitter, um, there's certain requirements, again, that, that have to be in that contract, right? Um, and some of those, and, and it's great, Colorado is great about it. They, they post a checklist uh, for you right on the Secretary of State's Outfitter Registration page. 
Um, so you can go there and you can pull this checklist off um, as you're going through your your um, your contract with your outfitter. Um, so some of the things, you know, contract items um, by law, you know, our Title 12, Article 145, all right? In our contract and outfitter, we must list the type of services that we're going to provide. We must list the dates that we're going to provide them. We must list our transportation arrangements, well, whether that may be, I'm going to pick you up at the airport. I'm going to take you back to the airport. Um, we're going to take livestock into camp. We're going to take livestock out of camp. All that's going to be designated in there. Um, big thing, cost of service, right? Nothing's going to be hidden. You're going to be told it's going to be cost this much. Um, it's going to, you're going to have a, a upfront deposit. Um, we're going to talk about uh, what happens if you know I don't I can't fulfill my obligation what happens if the client can't fulfill their obligation what happens if you know for some reason that we have a natural disaster and the hunt cannot happen so all those things are gonna be covered in the contract um, ratio of clients to guides most of the times that you're gonna have um, a one to two ratio um, of one guide to two clients unless otherwise specified all right um, Again, we're at the outfitter's policy for regarding cancellation of contract and refund or any deposit. All right. And then there's always going to be the written statement within the contract for Colorado that, that says, pursuant to section 12 145 108, paragraph 1, subparagraph C, and paragraph 1, subparagraph D of the CRS, outfitters are bonded. So I was talking about surety bond and required to possess the minimum level of liability insurance and the activities of outfitters are regulated by the director. All right, so that statement's gonna be in there. All right, some other things that'll be in there, obviously our name, entity's name, business name, trade name, whatever it is, our license number, the location, physical location of the business office, contact information, um, our registration number, right? If it's an outfitter and they're operating um, outside those all right, within those services that we talked about, they must be registered outfitter, licensed outfitter within the state of Colorado. Um, refund policy we talked about, location of the hunt, what game unit are you going to be in, management unit are you going to be in, all right? Um, you're gonna, in the contract, it'll have the name of the surety bond company and the, the bond number. It'll have the name of the insurance company and the insurance number. Um, and those are the the mandatory things that you'll be looking at within the contract, right? And again, this can be found Secretary of State's website, Department of Regulatory Agencies, um, Outfitter Registration page, it'll be right there, checklist. Right? So those are some of the things that you can look at. Um, so once you go through all that, you know the regulations, um, you've checked your, your outfitter out, um, they are registered, they're bonded, they're insured. Um, you've planned ahead, right? Um, this is a conversation, like I said, that you're going to have with an outfitter over some time. This is not something that you should just willy-nilly and jump right into. Um, although, as an outfitter, we will we will take those contracts. Um, we just don't recommend it. You know, have that again that marriage relationship with your outfitter. Um, so some of the questions, you know, to ask uh, your outfitter. Um, and, and one of the big ones that people probably always talk about or that you'll see on websites or see, see people talk about is success rates, right? Um, so what's your success rate? Well, um, not only ask what the success rate is, but also ask um, how do they get that success rate? Like what what's the criteria for that success rate? Success rate? Because some outfitters... Um, what they'll do is they'll, their success rate will be based off of um, chances or opportunity, right? Well, all my clients have the opportunity to shoot that 6x6 six six bull elk, right? So I'm 100%. That's my success rate, right? Some hunter, some outfits, or their success rate is based off actual harvest of animals. So I had 10 clients, 5 clients harvested an animal or harvested that elk. Um, so I have a 50% success rate. Um, so just ask your outfitter, you know, if you're worried about those success rates and everything, hey, how do you get to your success rate? You know, what's the criteria for it? And then what is your success rate? All right. But, you know, again, talk to them because, you know, it might not, not have been a good year, right? 
say the year was extremely hot, uh, animals weren't moving, um, they had a tough calving season, you know, the chances just weren't there. These are some of the things that should, conversations you should have with your outfitter. Um, and then some seasons might just be wonderful and great and, and, you know, every client came in and knocked one down. So your success rates are going to change um, and they always could change. Um, another thing, conversation to have is where do you want to hunt, right? Um, some people don't want to be in a wilderness camp, um, you know, so many miles back into the mountains. They want to hunt on a ranch of, you know, um, and everything. So... <clears throat> Have that in your head on what you exactly want to do. Do you want to put yourself through, um, you know, roughing it, toughing it in the mountains? Do you want to have a little more relaxing trip, you know, sleeping in a, in a beautiful big lodge? Um, but just understand that your prices are going to vary a lot. And your prices are going to vary not only um, within the state, but when you go to different states also. Um, one of the other big things you should talk to your or ask your outfitter is referrals, testimonies, um, you know, past clients, right? So most of your outfitters uh, will go ahead and give, you know, those names out and say, hey, yeah, if you want, you know, a recommendation or, you know, someone want to talk to some of my past clients, here's one or two, three, whatever, um, give a phone number. And you can contact them and, and get an honest answer from them on, you know, one, were they good? Were they honest? Would you use them again? You know, that's a huge question, you know. Um, but again, just have that, um, have that conversation with your outfitter. And one of the biggest things, too, is uh, go ahead and communicate what your expectations are, all right? Um, so when you come into camp, uh or before you come into camp, you know, express to your outfitter, your guide, that, hey, I'm looking for, you know, this type of animal, you know, whether it be trophy, uh, whether you just want to meet, you know, or, and, and the outfitter is going to be very honest with you. Um, and they're going to tell you, hey, this is not, you know, a 380 bull management unit, or they're going to tell you, you know, hey, here, here's another outfitter's name that, you know, runs in this unit, and that's a trophy unit, you know. Um, I would say a majority of our outfitters are very honest, and, and they're going to give you honest answers um, because it's it's their livelihood and their job. Um, and that was just kind of a quick overview, you know, 20 minutes of, of – you know, what you should look at and, and everything for, for choosing your outfit for your Western hunt. And just understand that, you know, not not all outfitters are going to be for you. You know, it's it's like I said in the beginning, it's it's like a marriage, right? Um, some marriages end in divorce. Um, some marriages don't. Uh, so just understand that, you know, if you if you don't fit with that outfitter, you know, there's there's going to be other outfitters that you can try out and talk to and everything um and i can't express enough we spent a lot of time talking about regulations and everything i can't express enough that you know make sure you're using a legal um registered licensed outfitter um where required and uh that actually brings me to a good point so understand that uh, on public land um so we're talking federal lands state lands um like blm State wildlife management areas, uh, forest areas. Um, if there is an entity that is acting as an outfitter and actively um, guiding and outfitting on those types of land with taking compensation, they must be registered. And that's across every state. Um, so they must be registered and licensed. If you run into an outfit and and um, they're not, and they're operating on it, that is a huge fine. Um, so make sure that, you know, you're in the right, they're in the right before you, you get on that Western hunt. <clears throat> um, like I said, that was just, you know, a quick down and dirty. Hopefully um, I gave a little bit of information to you so you can, you know, start to, to make those um, informed decisions on, 
<coughs> excuse me, on uh, using an outfit. Um, and there's, you know, tons of, of great outfitters out there, and I highly recommend you use use them, especially if you're just getting into um, do it yourself or just getting into western hunting. I'm sorry. Um, there's nothing wrong with, with using that outfitter and getting a little bit of experience and picking their brains and then getting out there and, and doing a do-it-yourself hunt and everything. Um, so that's really all I had. Like I said, just quick down and dirty, and I, I just want to cover some key topics. And, and we're going to do some more videos um, leading up to the draw here in Colorado. We'll cover um, we'll cover this, this wonderful 2022 uh, big game brochure. Um, some of the rules changes that happened this year and, and just kind of understanding species tags and units and everything else and, and stuff. So, um, I look forward to, to doing some more videos and making sure everybody's good to go with, with, uh, getting out there and getting in the wilderness and, and doing some hunting and, and stuff. So now I'll just open it up to any questions that anybody might have and I'll do my best to um, try to try to answer them. I do have Andrew, what are some of the species in the chat? Sorry. Uh, what are some of the specific questions you would ask to identify any red flags with a potential outfitter? Um, and I don't know any if you were if you had a uh, when you got on and everything, but some of the specific questions, like I said, you know, hey, where some like really good questions are, hey, where are we hunting? All right? If they say, hey, we're going to be hunting in the Route National Forest, do you have a Forest Service special use permit? All right. If they say no, that's a huge red flag because they have to have one. Um, are you insured? Are you bonded? If they are a registered outfitter or licensed outfitter within uh, the state of Colorado, they must be insured and bonded. Um, and then again, uh, you know, this checklist, right? This checklist that, that is on the website, you know, ask every question on this checklist or make sure it's in within the contract um, before you, you sign that contract and go into any type of agreement with um that outfitter i hope that answered your question Andy. if you're still on any other questions and i know we got instagram and facebook rolling right now so i'm kind of just looking back and forth making sure we got any questions going on S. Oliver 26, best time to come fishing. Hey, um, so I just handle big game. Um, so our outfit, we do uh, elk, bear, mule deer, um, turkey, antelope, whitetail out on the plains on the, on the land we got out there. Um, so I'm sure there's... Uh, some good outfits and I know some people that will take you fishing um, I just don't do it um, I just stay busy with everything else so so to answer your question you come anytime and uh, we'll try to take care of you and get you squared away and if anybody's looking for uh, uh, like I said we're talking we talk specific about Colorado today but if if anybody is looking for a great outfit in uh, Wyoming, um, I've worked with Stetter Outfitters um, for the last couple of years, and they're an awesome outfit up there. Um, so if you got if you got the elk points and the the, the points um, for sheep and for mule deer, and then they Dustin and Laura get after it. So. Um, Check out Stetter Outfitters. They're awesome up there for Wyoming and everything. So, uh, Chuck says, how much H country do you hunt on the plains and what's available? I'm not sure what you mean, Chuck, by H country. Um, 
So we have um, 160 acres of private land on the plains uh, right now that's plumb full of antelope. Um, antelope season starts mid-August for archery, and then obviously we have the, the rifle seasons that follow in after that. Um, currently, um, okay, how much? Gotcha. Um, so currently, that's all we kind of use that 164 is the antelope and mule deer. Uh, we do have mule deer out there. There are some plains elks that pass through everything through there, um, and we are surrounded by the Comanche National Grasslands on three sides. Um, unfortunately, right now, Comanche National Grasslands is not authorizing outfitters um, to operate on that area, but I have been in talks with um, the director, and it looks like we might put it up for public comment and vote and everything to actually, excuse me, allow outfitters out on the Comanche National Grasslands. Now, that process can take you know, two years to go through and, and uh, special use permits issued. Um, so <clears throat> just something to think about, you know, we're not quite, you know, out there on the, you know, have that 450,000 acres um, of grass. And so we're kind of restricted to that 160, right? Because um, again, I'm a licensed registered outfitter. Um, but I do not have a special use permit for that public land. So I have to stay within my 160 acres of private land that I do own. All right. Um, hopefully, Chuck, that answer your question. Uh, we got some comments popping up on Facebook over here. Let's see here. Val says, does your beard have a name? <laughs> no, it doesn't. I'll let you name it, Val. Um... Andrew says, what are some of the touch points you want to have with your outfitter in regards to prep for the hunt once you select one or maybe save that for a future video? Um, touch points. Um, we can talk a little bit about it. And so, you know, like I said, you want to have an intimate relationship with your outfitter, right? Um, so gear, you know, talk to your outfitter about gear. Some of the gear, um, you know, some gear can be provided. A lot of it's not going to be provided. That's going to be on um, that individual client hunter to bring their own gear. Um, but talk about, you know, archery season is a huge thing, right? Um, so talk about bow setup, arrow setups, um, things like that, because, you know, we might get a lot of clients coming from the East Coast where we're used to, you know, some smaller white-tailed deer where it doesn't take so much of a, you know, FOC on an arrow to take down, and now you're coming out and you're dealing with an eight, nine hundred pound um, elk, you know, in the mountains. So <clears throat> those are some of the things you want to talk about, you know, specific gear for, um, you know, that hunt, you know, um, what to expect as far as physical fitness, right? Um, our base camp is uh, right around, I would say, 7,500 feet. Um, Stedder's base camp, which we were talking about earlier, uh, up in Wyoming, there's base camp, if I remember correctly, is like right around 96, 110,000 feet, right? So that's a huge difference, even from seven to 10,000 feet, all right? And now you're talking, again, somebody coming from coastlines, where east or west coast, you know, at zero, coming out here, not only, you know, the oxygen is going to get you, the elevation is going to get you, the rugged, you know, up and down is going to get you. But if you're in, you know, decent physical fitness shape, <clears throat> all that you can overcome within a day or two um, into your hunt where it's not going to just take you out of the hunt and, and you spend five days in camp just miserable. You know, I hope I answered your question, Andrew. Let me know if I missed the, the target on that for sure and, the, and I'll do a better job and on trying to answer something like that. And Chuck, did I answer your answer? Did I answer your question correctly? And one thing, Chuck, too, on the Plains area is it, it's mostly private out there, minus uh, Comanche National Grasslands, and um, uh, there's a couple other you know small public lands out there. So um, if you do want to do it yourself out there and try to um, and get a hunt on, um, just make on the public or, you know, having that permission on private to, 
to go ahead and hold them. Again, Chuck, let me know if I if I missed missed the mark on that answer, and and I'll try to do a better job on getting the answer for you. Any other questions? Not seeing anything come across. Well, awesome. So I think um, probably the next video that uh, we'll probably look at doing, like I said, is we'll, we'll dive into this, into the, the big game brochure, and um, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll pick that apart with the regulations and some of the changes and everything because there were some pretty solid changes that happened this year, uh, which is pretty cool. So... Um, we'll dive a little into that and, and, uh, and we'll talk about, um, just navigating the Colorado draw. Cause if you haven't done it, it can be extremely confusing for you. Um, so hopefully, um, we can dive right into it and, and pick it apart and everything. So when the draw does open up in March, um, you got a little bit of knowledge to make yourself dangerous and get in there and, and make your choices and, and hopefully draw that, uh, that coveted tag that you've always wanted to draw and everything and and uh give us a call and hopefully we can get you on a hunt sounds good well i thank everybody for for uh coming in and, and watching and asking some questions and and hopefully uh um this was helpful and and uh, you know helped you out with with making a choice and everything for for getting on that western hunt thanks guys